Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. If you could fill out the member and the guest cards in the pews as we keep track of attendance, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, We have a few special prayers this morning. We pray for the family of Carol Seward as Carol has gone home to glory and her funeral was this last week. We keep Pastor Brian Krieger in our prayers, Mr. Mark Renner and myself in our prayers as uh, we continue to hold our calls. Uh, Pastor Brian Krieger currently serves at a um, a dual site ministry in Minnesota, uh, at, in Shakopee and Bloomington. Uh, and Mr. Mark Renner serves as principal at Resurrection in Rochester, Minnesota. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, and we also pray for Phil Follick, Shirley Hoffman, and Sandra Wolski, who are all dealing with, uh, with some health complications and have been hospitalized recently. And as you have seen on the front of your folder, our our series that we're in right now is Rethinking Religion. Uh, A lot of people in our culture have uh, assumptions about Christianity, and many people are leaving Christianity, Um, but are their assumptions always correct? Uh, And maybe sometimes you and I even have assumptions about Christianity. Uh, Are those always correct? And so we're kind of looking at different aspects of Christianity, and today we look at worship, rethinking what the purpose of worship, what it looks like. So uh, maybe think about what some of your non-Christians friends think of worship, maybe some ideas that you have about worship, and we'll see what Scripture tells us about worship this morning. We will begin with our opening hymn, Open Lovely Doors, but before that, turn to those whom you'll be worshiping with this morning and say hello. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, We have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done these things that we should not have done. 
and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with our hymn, Lord, Have Mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and do what is right, that we, who cannot do anything that is good without you, may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for this morning comes from Exodus chapter 20. Worship is not just gathering together on Sundays, but it really is your and mine. It's our whole life and how we live according to God's will. And the Lord lays out how we should do that with the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt, where you are slaves. You shall have no other gods beside me. 
You shall not make any carved image for yourself or a likeness of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or be subservient to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I follow up on the guilt of the fathers with their children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren, if they also hate me. But I show mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not permit anyone who misuses his name to escape unpunished. Remember the Sabbath day by setting it apart as holy. Six days you are to serve and do all your regular work. But the seventh day shall be a Sabbath of rest to the Lord your God. Do not do any regular work, neither you, nor your sons, nor daughters, nor your male or female servants, nor your cattle, nor the alien who is residing inside your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. In this way the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may spend many days on the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. We continue with our song of praise without his cross, sung by our choir. The New Testament reading for this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This will serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. 
For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In fact, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will bring to nothing. Where is the wise man? Where is the expert in the Jewish law? Where is the probing thinker of the present age? Has God not shown that the wisdom of this world is foolish? Indeed, since the world, through its wisdom, did not know God, God, in his wisdom, decided to save those who believe through the foolishness of the preached message. Yes, Jews ask for signs, Greeks desire wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which is offensive to Jews and foolishness to Greeks, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We preach Christ crucified because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand out of respect for the gospel. The gospel reading for this morning comes from John chapter 2. Reverence for God in worship had become obscured and corrupted by the Jewish people as the temple had turned into a marketplace. The Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers sitting at tables. He made a whip of cords and drove everyone out of the temple courts, along with the sheep and oxen. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those selling doves, he said, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews responded, What sign are you going to show us to prove you can do these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. The Jews said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days. But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. When Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. Then they believed the scripture and what Jesus had said. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, The Law of God is Good and Wise, hymn 637.
God's grace, His mercy, and His peace, those three things are yours, dear sisters and brothers in Christ. Knowledge is power. You've probably heard that phrase before. It's, it's, a, it's an idea that, that goes back quite a long ways. Actually, it's found in Scripture in, in the book of Proverbs. But that modern sense, that phrase of knowledge is power is originally ascribed to Sir Francis Bacon, an English statesman and philosopher in the 16th century. Knowledge is power. And Thomas Jefferson picked up on that idea, and we find it in some of his correspondence with other people, and he kind of expanded it, and he said, knowledge is power, knowledge is safety, knowledge is happiness. Knowledge is power, right? The the more knowledge that you have about things, the the more well-equipped you are to deal with situations, and maybe in our heated political world, we kind of think, "If if I have the right knowledge, I can win an argument against my enemy. I can show them that I'm smarter than them and kind of lord that power over them. Knowledge is safety. The more knowledge we have about things, the more aware we can be, the more we can protect ourselves and our families. Knowledge is happiness. Not so sure about that one. I feel like there's things that if I didn't know about, I would be happy, but Maybe where where Thomas Jefferson's coming from is that uh, the more I know, right, the more I can spread the good wealth, or or I'm not exactly sure what he was thinking, but I think these ideas permeate our culture now, where we think that the more knowledge, the more wisdom we have, the better off things are going to be for us, the better our lives will be, the smoother things will go. The Greeks in Paul's day, had that same idea. They, they pursued knowledge and wisdom as they debated with one another about the, the current philosophies of the day, what was the best, what was the best way to live. They debated that back and forth. Paul talks about the Greeks looked for wisdom and Jews looked for signs from God, right? They had the truth, the Old Testament scriptures, and so they wanted to verify things by looking for signs from God. And so, the Greeks had wisdom. The Jews looked for that, uh, that outward power from God. And those things clearly had value to them. Those things led to assurance, to wisdom and power. But Paul comes in and he says something different. But we preach Christ crucified. First of all, we. right? So Paul, talking about himself and also his associates, Silas, Timothy, those people, but also the Corinthians. We. And in that Corinthian congregation, there were Jews. And there were Greeks, those who had come to a knowledge of the truth. And that truth was the message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead. That is the truth, the truth which shapes All reality, the truth of Christ crucified. And that is why those Corinthian Christians would gather together to hear that message, to hear it proclaimed. And that is why you and I gather together on Sunday mornings. That is why we worship together, is to hear that message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead for the forgiveness of sins. But that message sounds ridiculous to the world. First of all, you believe in in one God. Throughout history, that is kind of an enigma in itself. Most cultures have more than one God you believe in. So you believe in one God, and that God decided to come down into this, this filthy garbage of a world, and he became man. So your God becomes man. And he didn't come to to establish a glorious kingdom or anything like that, but he came to die. That's your God. Your God died. But he became man, and you're telling me that this man rose from the dead. That's what you believe. It's foolishness to the world. 
And maybe there's times when you, you think about that and you think about what you believe, what you adhere to, and those doubts of the world and the doubts of your sinful self rise up. And you have those same questions. Do I actually believe this? This is pretty crazy. How do I know that a God exists even at all? How do I know that the true God is the, the Christian God, the one revealed in Scripture? And those are questions which our culture has bought into and it spirals downward. And that's, that's true of cultures throughout all of history. But in our culture, there is a, a group of people increasing in number who identify themselves as nuns. And that's not a bunch of people that are joining Roman Catholic convents. Uh, nuns, as in N-O-N-E-S. They don't adhere to any religion. They, maybe they don't outrightly deny that God exists or could exist, but they say, well, I don't, I don't really need that. What's the purpose of that? What's the purpose to, to going to church on, on Sunday mornings? Seems just kind of like a, a dusty, antiquated ritual. I don't need that at all. And Satan capitalizes on this. He wants to raise those questions. What is the point of worship? Does God really exist? I don't think you actually need it. Satan wants to obscure that message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead. And with the outward influences of the world, with Satan doing his best to attack you, because you are Christians, you are God's people, he's going to attack you. And then you have the old sinful self, which buys into those lies. It's difficult. And so what do you do? Go back to the simple truth of Christ crucified, brothers and sisters. Remember that that is why we gather here this morning. That's why we always gather together, to hear that proclamation, to hear the very words of the living God. And those words, when they are proclaimed, they, they have power, they have influence. They shape and mold your heart. They strengthen your faith in Christ crucified. And it's foolishness. To the world. It's foolishness to your sinful nature, but your sinful nature is not who you are at your core. It is not who your Savior has declared you to be. You are a new self, created through faith in Christ Jesus, and that message then of Christ crucified and risen from the dead is not foolishness. It is not weakness as it would appear to be, but it is the power of God. It is the wisdom of of God. The power of God creates. Think of Genesis chapter 1. God created out of nothing. And how did he do that? Well, he spoke his word. And the word of God, the message of Christ crucified, creates faith. When people hear that word, the Holy Spirit is active. That is the power of God. It is the wisdom of God. Foolishness to the world, but the message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead makes you wise for salvation. God speaks eternal truths through that message of Christ crucified. Trust that word, brothers and sisters, because God's word is is God's Word. It is in the inspired Word of God, and God does not lie. And as Paul wrote to Timothy, go back to the Scriptures again and again because you know those from whom you learned it. You trust those from whom you learned the Scriptures, that message of Christ crucified. When you struggle, when you have doubts, go back again and again, fleeing to God's Word, fleeing to Jesus with that childlike faith that just clings to Him. And then after you do that, then you can use reason. Then use logic to answer some of those questions, to answer some of those questions the world has, that, to answer some of those doubts that arise in your heart and your mind. Like, how do I even know that God exists? Well, just look at the complexity of our world. The 
insane fine tuning of uh, of cells, the, the human cells, the, the plant cells, and how fine tuned everything is, the complexity of it. How do you get something, this world, out of nothing? How does evolution play into that? There is a God brothers and sisters. How do I know that the God of the Bible is the true God? Compare Christianity with all of the other world religions. And what do you find? You find that all of the other religions, all the other beliefs of the world, they all focus ultimately, when you get down to it, on me and how I live my life. What do I have to do to get right with whatever deity it is? But Christianity stands out as being an enigma, as being odd, that it says you cannot do anything. And that's not fun to hear. It's painful to hear, but it is also a relief because the gospel is that Jesus has done everything for you. Do not look inside yourself, but look outside yourself to what Christ has done for you. It is a free gift. There's absolutely nothing you have to do. All of the guilt and the shame from your life Those sins that whisper in your ear and keep you up at night, Christ has taken those away from you. He makes everything new. He restores righteousness and salvation to you. And so we use rational thinking, we use logic underneath Scripture. It serves Scripture. It is not elevated above Scripture. But Satan seeks to flip that around. He seeks to disrupt that message of Christ crucified. He doesn't want you to run back to the Scriptures, back to the truths of God's Word with a childlike faith. He wants you to elevate reason and logic above God's Word and to say, well, that that really doesn't make sense. God becoming man, that's ridiculous. One man dying for the sins of the whole world, that's too far-fetched. Satan wants you to think, I mean, I think when I read God's word here, I think that God didn't really mean this. I know we live in the 21st century. After all, this may have been applicable 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, but now we've kind of outgrown that as a culture. I think God means this instead. Flee back to the pure message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead, brothers and sisters. That's the most important truth that there is. That's the truth that shapes all of reality. That's why we gather here this morning for worship. You gather with your brothers and sisters to come into the presence of God and hear His words and what He has done for you. You come to worship not because of the type of music that you're going to hear. You don't come to hear me. You don't come to see specifically other people as are maybe benefits of it, perks. That's not why you come. You don't come because worship is this thing that I want it exactly this way and it makes me feel good. No, you come to worship to hear the message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead for the forgiveness of sins. That is what you and I need. That is why you and I gather around the Word and the sacraments, which you are about to partake in 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 a little bit, where you receive Christ's body and blood. Jesus comes to you and said, this is how much I love you, to assure you that your sins are forgiven. Take my body and blood into yourself. Receive the forgiveness of sins. Receive my peace and grace and mercy. The foolishness of Christ crucified is a foolishness that we cherish, that we hold close. We go back to that message again and again. That message of Christ crucified is why you forgive your spouse for when they say things that hurt you, or why your spouse forgives you when you have said things that hurt them. The message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified is the reason why you are patient with your children, with your parents, 
with your enemies, who's, who, with those whom you disagree. The message of Christ crucified is why when you carry out all of your different roles and your callings in your life and you fail at those, it is why your God, even though you fail, says, well done, good and faithful servant. Because he sees Christ, the crucified, the Son of God, the perfect substitute in your place. That which appears to be foolishness is the wisdom of God. It is the power of God by which your soul is saved. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Amen. Please stand as we join together and confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the prayer of the church. Lord, let us not grow weary of attending worship but see it as the blessing it truly is, a time we come to be filled with your grace and forgiveness, a time to encourage one another and hear that message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead. Lord, grant peace to Carol Seward's family as they mourn Carol's death. Comfort them with the knowledge of the resurrection and the truth that Carol is with you now in glory, free from all distress and pain. We ask that you grant wisdom and patience to Pastor Brian Krieger, Mr. Mark Renner, myself, and our families as we each deliberate the calls we hold. Build up your kingdom in all places where your people are gathered, and we ask that you would provide more workers for your harvest field. Lord, rest your healing hand upon Phil Follick, Shirley Hoffman, and Sandra Wolski, and grant them recovery according to your will. Grant them and their families calm hearts and minds, knowing that in all things you are with them and will bring them through their hardships. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue to worship our Lord with our offerings.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in the prayer Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
may be seated. The Lord's table is now ready. If you are not a member of St. Paul's or the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, we do ask that you refrain from coming up to communion until you have a chance to talk with us about the blessings offered in the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you would like to, to join in the Lord's Supper and make that fellowship with uh, your brothers and sisters here, uh, please feel free to talk to me after the service or later in the week.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, The Gospel Shows the Father's Grace. It has been a pleasure to worship with you this morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, a couple things. I've got two call acknowledgement letters here. Uh, this first one is from uh, Mr. Mark Renner, the principal we called to serve here at St. Paul's. Dear members of St. Paul's, on Monday, February 26th, I was informed that the Holy Spirit had led the voters of St. Paul's to extend a divine call to me to serve as principal and 7th and 8th grade teacher at your school. I look forward to learning about the ministry at St. Paul's and prayerfully considering where the Lord would have me use my gifts to serve. I would ask for your prayers for myself and my family as I deliberate the two calls I now hold. Pray that the Lord of the church would fill both calls to where I currently serve in Rochester, Minnesota, and to St. Paul's with the people he knows will best serve at each place. Please feel free to reach out to me regarding my call to St. Paul's. I would appreciate any input you might have. May God's will be done. In Christ's service, Mark A. Renner. Uh, the next one is from Pastor Brian Krieger. Dear brothers and sisters in the faith at St. Paul Stevensville, Michigan, greetings in the name of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who suffered, died, and rose from the grave for us that we might forever be his family. 
Monday evening, February 26th, I was informed that you extended a divine call to me to serve as associate pastor at St. Paul's. What a wonderful blessing God has given to our congregations through the calling process. I acknowledge your call and certainly look forward to hearing more about the people and ministry in Stevensville. Thank you also for promptly sending the call packet, which is a great help. Your prayers and encouragements are powerful tools to aid me in deliberating this call. Please also include in your prayers the ministry of Bloomington Living Hope, where I currently serve. Please feel free to reach out to me via email so I can know your needs and consider how best to serve you and your community. I'm confident that the Holy Spirit will continue to guide us and empower us in the weeks ahead. Grace and peace to all of you in Christ Jesus. Brian Krieger. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, so keep uh, Mr. Pastor Krieger and Mr. Renner in your prayers in the coming weeks. Uh, today, after service, we have a special history presentation by Freddie Krieger about the, uh, the founding members of St. Paul. So if you're interested in that, you can stick around. That will be in the fellowship hall. Uh, I will still be holding BIC today. We're going to be in the fifth and sixth grade room um, for those of you attending that. Uh, note that there is no Lenten worship this Wednesday. No Lenten worship this Wednesday. However, Thursday evening is the MLC concert. That is at 7 p.m. Uh, it, will be, it will be good. You don't want to miss it, so please, uh, please come to that. Um, and then next Sunday or next weekend is Daylight Savings, so just, uh, just mark that on your calendar so you can be, you can be on time. God's blessings on the rest of your day and the rest of your week.